right. Shabbat shalom, everyone. Let's get right into the message. What a great time of worship and a prophetic anointing and all the time we had. And how amazing God manifested the meaning of this Torah portion in our service. Amen. So we're looking at Parshat, Parshat Shmini. Uh, and the message is clean or unclean? Amen. How many feel clean today? Amen. 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 We're looking at Vayikra, Leviticus 9, 1 through 11, 47. Shmuel, Beit, or 2 Samuel 6, 1 through 7, 17, and Acts 10, 9 through 22, and we finish with 34 and 35. So we want to say Brochim Havaim to our first time guest. Some of them had to take off away, but we had some first time guests all over in India today, yes. and we're, we just say welcome, we're glad you, you came. Leviticus 9.1 is very important. It gives us the eighth-day consecration of the tabernacle. I'm not going to read all of it today, uh, but we do see the use of a golden calf uh, uh, in the mountains, Mount Sinai experience. And so to atone for that sin, Moses is telling Aaron and his sons to take a male calf, a egel, the same term used for het, a egel shel zahav, which is the sin of the golden calf, to be used for a sin offering. The idea is that it's for atonement for their willful sin. Uh, so it's interesting that Aaron was the one that was a part of that. So here you have Aaron making atonement. And then of course, then there's the offering also of a ram for a burnt offering, uh, both without defect. And verse 3 says, The people of Israel to take a male goat like the Yom Kippur goat. Some rabbis say it goes back to Joseph. The idea of his brothers selling him into slavery while they told their dad he was dead uh, with the blood. Uh, of a goat on his coat of many colors for the sin offering and a calf and a lamb both of a year old without defect now verse 9 goes on to talk about an ox for a peace offering and then it says uh, sacrifices before the Lord even a grain offering mixed with olive oil I think what's most important is the fact that it says in, in verse uh, 5 not only that in verse 4 that uh, a God was a God was going to appear to them but in verse 5 that says they brought what Moshe had ordered before the tent of meeting and the whole community approached and stood before the Lord literally in the Hebrew like one they all came into unity uh, Rashi says that it was on the eighth day of these um, investitures that it was the first month of Nisan the very day on which the Mishkan was erected and this day took ten crowns of distinction which are enumerated in the Seder Olam or Seder HaOlam 7 or in the writings of Torah Kohanim the laws of the priest 9-1 read notes on back so if you turn the back of your notes you'll see that I've actually enumerated for you what Seder HaOlam says in Jewish writings what they say is based upon Rashi uh, on Leviticus 9-1 he says the first crown is the crown of creation as that of the first of Nisan was a Sunday so he's saying even though it's the first of Nisan, it goes back to really to the first of Tishrei, which represents the first of creation because it was the time that Mishkan was created to be used, just like the earth was created to be used. So the first of the month, like the first of the month. Now we know God took Tishrei 1 of creation and said now seven, uh, six months later, we're reversing it, and now Nisan is going to be like the beginning of months for you. So he says it kind of rehearses creation. The second thing is it rehearses the first day that the offerings were brought by the princes of the tribes of Israel. It also represents the first day of the assumption of the kehunah, the priesthood, by Aaron and his sons. This is the first time they step into the priesthood. The fourth thing, it's the first day of the regular Mizbeach service or the altar service. Wow, we just had an altar service, didn't we? <laughs> In a spiritual sense. It's also number five, the fifth day... <laughs> Uh, the first day where the fire descended from heaven on the Mizbeach, just like it did during Solomon's day, it did uh, under the days of Moses, Aaron, and the priests. So the fire came down from heaven, so there was an earthly fire the priests made, but there was a heavenly fire that came down. How many know we felt the heavenly fire come down today? Amen. 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 Number seven, the first day... Or actually, number six, the first day that the, the restrictions for eating offerings on the grounds of the Mizpah, which we also know that portion gives us restrictions on what we can eat, even as his people. And then number seven, the first day of the prohibition against offerings on private altars, meaning you can't take a, a, a lamb and sacrifice it in your backyard and put it on your barbecue and say this is an altar to the Lord. 
<laughs> you might cook lamb that way, right. lamb chops that way, but don't call it the Lord's offering. Right. It's just a meal, right. okay? Because this is holy unto the Lord. Now, the next thing we see, um, did I only go to seven? Oh, I only went to seven. Don't I have uh, three more? Yeah, on your notes. I didn't put it on the outline, but let's take a look at the last three. So the last three, um, the first day of the first month of the year, it's also number nine, the first day of the Shekinah, or the Shekinah, rested on amongst Kalal Israel, which means the entire house of Israel, in the Mishkan. And finally, the first day that the Kohanim gave the priestly blessing. Wow. In other words, everything related to priestly ministry all kind of started on this first day. The temple, the tabernacle was inaugurated, and so was the priesthood. So it's like a first, a first, a first, right? So think about this new beginning, because this is done on the eighth day, which is a number of new beginnings. New beginning. So everything was consecrated in the seventh day and ready to be used on the eighth day. How interesting. God created the world in six days. He rests on the seventh day. And then he says, now you can use it on the eighth day. So we see from a Sunday to a Saturday or Shabbat, we have seven days and we have an eighth day on the following Sunday. Okay. So, this is important to understand when we look at Leviticus 11, which I think is a little bit more on the topic I want to talk about, about clean and unclean. It says, Adonai said to Moshe and Aharon, tell the people of Israel, these are the living creatures which you may eat among all the animals, the land animals. Notice that they're all animals, but they're not all food. Right. Yes. Amen. Just because it's an animal doesn't mean you eat it. I'm so glad I don't eat camel, bats, right? <laughs> Cricket, I mean, uh, 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 not crickets, but... Uh, cockroaches? Yes. Chocolate covered cockroaches doesn't sound good, does it? No, no. No, no. Bat soup? Not in my no. Rotisserie camel? No thanks. <laughs> so there's, there's a lot of animals, but only certain things called food. Clean and unclean. Even Noah knew this, right? Now look what he says. Of land animals, any that have a separate hoof, which is completely divided and choose the cut, these animals you may eat. But you are not to eat those things are those that only chew the cud or only have a separated hoof. For example, the camel, the coney, which is a rabbit, or a type of rabbit, and the hare, another uh, form of a rabbit, um, are unclean for you because they chew the cud but they don't separate the hoof. So something in separation means you're going to be eating all the junk they eat because they don't separate and you didn't separate. God says, I separated Israel from the nations. I separated the seventh day from the six days of creation. I separate things that are profane versus things that are holy, things that are clean and unclean for you. So you separate because they separate. Did you catch that? Yeah. You separate because they separate. You know what? You never want to eat with a person they can't separate. Because you know what? You'll eat what they eat. If they eat unhealthy, you eat unhealthy. Because you haven't learned to separate. The Bible says separate yourselves. Guess what? If you talk to a person that maybe 75% of the time they, they have good stuff to say, but there's that 25% that they just cuss and are foul and are negative and complainers and gossipers, guess what? I'm sorry. Even your 75% is now defiled by the 25% of the junk. Yeah. That's right. Because if I take a drop of poison and put it in your water, I'm going to know all the water is poison now. Yes. Right, right. So we want to make sure we, we eat things that separate just as we learn to separate. That's a sermon all in itself, isn't it? Look at verse 7. It says, While the pig is unclean for you, because although it has a, sep it has a separate and completely divided hoof, it doesn't chew the cud. Short digestive system. You are not to eat meat from these or touch their carcasses. They are unclean for you. Look at the Greek here. The Greek word here, I have both Greek letters and then I have the transliteration. I know you don't all read, read Greek. But there's one word I want to stand out for you. And this is the word akatharta. Say that. Akatharta. The actual Greek word is akathartos. And akathartos is referring to not being cleansed, unclean in a ceremonial sense, that which must be abstained from according to the Levitical law, and also in a moral sense, unclean in thought and life. So even though you eat clean food, what if you let come out of your mouth is unclean? Or you, what you take into your ears is unclean. That can lead to an unclean life. So you can see already the physical represents the spiritual, and the spiritual affects the physical, right? So 
The reason I brought this out, because if we look back here on the Septuagint, this is the Greek translation of this Hebrew verse. So they took the Hebrew and they translated every single word, and the word for unclean was akathartum. Can you say that? Akathartum. Now, we saw the definition, means not to be clean, obviously. But the reason we looked it up is because now we have a working um, relationship between the Old and the Newer Testament, and we can actually look at passages like in Acts chapter 10 and find out what's being talked about. But Peter said, not so, Lord, I have never eaten anything what? Common, which is koinos, like koine Greek, common Greek, or koinonia, having all things in common, meaning fellowship. I've never eaten anything koinos. In this case, common was a Levitical term referring to something not to be used for that which is holy. So common oil is good oil. Cook with it, use it in mascaras, right, or, or skin conditions. But it's not for the holy anointing oil. Because that has to be holy oil that's separated. So even though it's decent, it's good, but it's common. It's for common use. He says, or unclean, akathartos. Look at the Greek term. Akathartos. So we have the same word used in Leviticus about eating something unclean. And there are actually two different terms. I don't have time to go into all of that today, but we will. Now, while Peter wondered within himself what this vision he had seen meant. Notice he had no idea as a good Jewish boy, knowing the Torah, what this meant. He absolutely knew it didn't disregard Leviticus 11, right? Because he would have said, oh, I know, God's getting rid of the Torah. In fact, he should have said, oh, that's right. Yeshua for three and a half years said, get rid of the Torah. Wrong. He said, I came to destroy the Torah. Yeah, wrong, Is that what Yeshua said? No. no, he said, don't think I came to destroy the Torah in right. Matthew 5, 17. So we know Peter was uh, befuddled here. I don't know what this means. He's asking the Lord to reveal to him what this vision means because he knows that a subjective vision is not objective. If I say don't eat something, that's objective. Don't eat this, that's objective. If I subjectively refer to something metaphorically or give a loose translation or I said, oh, I was dreaming about, you know, like back in the hippie days and you're like, what does that have to do with the Torah, Rabbi? It's so subjective, you have to almost deduce what you think I mean by it. It's not clear. So if this is not a clear instruction, because God never instructs people solely by a vision, solely by a dream, he gives them the actual word of the Lord and confirms his words with signs and wonders following, and then he lets that word be written down so we can have, it is written, what thus saith the Lord. Amen? Amen? How many know we have, need clarity in the house of God? Amen. How many know we need wisdom in the house of God? Amen. Okay? So he says, he didn't know what this meant, and look what it says as we keep reading. It says... He wondered within himself what this vision which he had seen meant. Behold, the men who had been sent from Cornelius, this is a Gentile, a God-fearing Gentile, had, many, uh, had many, uh, made inquiry for Simon's house. He came Simon Peter. And stood before the gate. Now while Peter wondered within himself what this vision which he had seen meant, behold, the men who had been sent from Cornelius. He, meant, he, he now is pondering twice. Two times he goes, I don't get this vision. He's like, these guys are coming to my house, but I have no understanding what this vision means. I'm like befuddled. Can you imagine someone trying to talk to you? You're like, hold on, I'm still thinking about something right now. This, I'm bugged by this vision I had. He says, behold, the men who had been sent from Cornelius had made inquiry for Simon's house, and they stood before the gate. I feel like that was a, uh, had posted twice. So I think I doubled that accident. Look at verse 28 as we jump down. Peter gets the revelation. He says, then he said to them, you know how unlawful it is for a Jewish man to keep company with or go to one of another nation, meaning a Gentile. A Jew was told by the Pharisees through 18 laws or measures of separation that you're not to have anything to do with a Gentile. So most of the disciples were under those laws and actually tried to follow them the best they could until Yeshua would openly break them and allow a woman to be washing his feet or, or a Pharisee uh, uh, sees him eating with a publican or a sinner and all of a sudden now he kind of broke the rules, didn't he? Sure. So notice what it says. It says he's not to uh, keep company with anyone who's of another nation. Look at verse uh, 28, the latter part. But God has shown me that I should not call any man what? common, koinos, or unclean, akathartos. Ah. The unclean animal is being related to the unclean person. And the common 
animal or thing is related to the unclean person. So he says, stop calling Gentiles that are God-fearing Gentiles who even know Messiah unclean anymore. Stop treating Gentiles like pigs. Because I know, Peter, you haven't eaten anything unclean. That's why I can give this revelation to you. Because you get it. But stop putting the Gentile in the unclean category. Because once I wash them from their uncleanness, they are no longer unclean. They are washed from their sins. Isn't that a beautiful thing? They're washed of their pagan ways. Now, look at this. 2 Corinthians 6, 16 explains this concept. And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? How many know spiritually we're the temple? For you are the temple of the living God, and God said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God, they shall be my people. Therefore, based on that revelation, come out from among them, from among them meaning the pagans, and be what? Separate. separate. Not only separate your food. Good carb, bad carb. No. <laughs> Good protein, bad protein. Good fats, bad fats. Right? You need to separate, right? Separate who you hang around. Oh, but they're a good person. You just don't know them. No, I know them. You know them too. Judge their life. Judge their fruits. You say, well, I'm not supposed to judge. No, the Bible says you know a tree by its fruits. So if a tree gives bad fruit one day and then it gives bad fruit another day, I'm sorry, the roots are rotten. The tree is bad. The branch doesn't produce a good tree. Good fruit. So you've got to know people, things, situations by the fruit it produces. If you're in a relationship and the person you're with is making you walk away from God, act like they act, or, or, or not have time with God because they want you to be wrapped up in them, you also know that's an unbalanced relationship. That's right, yeah. You might even be unequally yoked with an unbeliever because you want to make sure in a relationship you're yoked with people that are of the same spirit, yes. that have the same heart, and love God the way you love God. You've got to be careful about relationships because relationships refer to God's relationship with us. He says, be ye separate as I'm separate. So we have to know separation. That means distinction, discernment, and wisdom. Amen? Amen. Now, this is the amazing thing about this, um, this passage. It's actually quoting what uh, scholars believe are a couple of different passages. And it says, come out from among them, be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is what? Unclean. Akathartos. And I will receive you. Wow. He says, don't even touch it, and then I'll receive you. Because when you touch something unclean, what happened to you? You're you became defiled. Yeah. If you partake and are involved in things that are unclean, it will defile you. There's no doubt about it. He says, then I will receive you. Wait a minute. Here's the God who loves everybody, who receives everybody. He says, I won't receive you if you're touching the unclean thing. Hello? Yes. Echo, echo, echo. <laughs> oh, no, you don't understand. The Lord knows I can go to that bar and hang out with that person because it's just a couple of drinks, you know. Didn't, didn't Yeshua drink wine? But Yeshua never went to a bar. And no, Yeshua didn't sit on a stool until he was sloppy drunk, just barely having a couple of beer nuts or peanuts to barely get him over. He had wine at a wedding where there was a full-blown meal. He never allowed himself to get drunk because when they accused him of uh, not a drunkard but a wine bibber, they said, well, he's sipping on it all day. Well, a sip is one thing, but they were saying he does it all day long. Well, that was an accusation. So just because somebody accuses you of something doesn't mean you've done it. That's right. Until it's been proven. Two or three witnesses, every word's established. So guess what? That's the way you need to separate. Oh, uh, I'm sorry, that's gossip. Oh, uh, I'm sorry, that's unclean. No, I'm sorry, I can't do that. Let me tell you, uh, a person that told me they were, you know, giving up a certain relationship so they can go all for God, then the next minute they get back to that person and they're watching an R-rated movie and then they wonder why their life and their spiritual walk and their... I was talking with someone just the other day and they're, I'm thinking, do you see the pattern your life is going? You're getting with people that think it's okay to let all that filth, violence, vulgar, nudity into your spirit and think you're going to come and worship God with hands lifted up and think, oh, well, I saw that, but it doesn't really affect me. Yeah. It defiles you, your mind, your emotions, your thoughts. Even a broken relationship can defile you. It's true. A broken marriage can defile you, where you can't even go into the next relationship the right way because you're still hurt from the last relationship. How many know and say amen to that? Yeah. People hurt you. Yep. And they don't realize they're defiling you, but you can choose to be cleansed of it. Right. Give your temple to Yeshua, 
I'm gonna wash that person right out of my hair and send them on their way. <laughs> now, I love this. He says, I will be a father to you. I love, I love the way Paul applies a prophecy of David's kids and Messiah to everybody. He says, I will be a father to you. And you should be sons and daughters, saith the Lord. Now, technically, God never said sons and daughters in the Hebrew Scriptures. Never. Because men represent the daughters, the household. The daughter is represented by the father until she's married to her husband. So he didn't have to. Knowing he's speaking to a Greek audience, he says, well, just so you Greeks don't get upset, let me break this down for you. The prophecy of sons includes daughtership as well as sonship. Because in Messiah, we're all one. And there is no male or female. Technically, we're all spirits who have souls who live in a body. Therefore, we're all children, or we have to break it up into sons and daughters. But the prophecy doesn't say that. Paul is applying the principle of sonship to daughtership. Aren't you glad, women, that God didn't leave you out in the prophecies? Yes. They included under sonship, daughtership. In fact, let's take a look at the prophecy. It's in our Haftarah this week. 2 Samuel 7:12. God said to David, when your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I'll raise up your offspring after you. Offspring, children, descendants. And it says, who shall come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build, he shall build, he shall build. That's a son, not a daughter. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I'm just waiting for the day that the reform movement says the Messiah is going to be a woman. <laughs> I'm telling you, it's next. Well, no, there's coming a day. Yeah. But how many know you can't liberalize the scriptures? Right. They have a context. Right. And you read the text in context. Right. The Messiah is a he. Right. He bore our sickness. He bore our disease. He took on our chastisement for our, uh, so we could have shalom. He took on our pain and our sorrows. He, he, he. You can't make the Messiah a woman. Right. Even if he's the seed of a woman. Right. So in context... It's talking about Messiah or sons of David. Because look what it says. It says in verse 14, I will be to him a father and he shall be to me a what? Son. A son. Now, another verse that, it, that uh, scholars say that is connected in the 2 Corinthians 6 passage is Isaiah 52.1. Listen to this. Awake, awake, Sion, or Zion. Clothe yourselves with strength. Dress in your splendid garments like priests. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the holy city, for the uncircumcised and the what? Unclean. Unclean will enter you no more. Now wait a minute, please be, un be clear about this. We're not talking about the wall of separation between Gentiles and Jews. What we're talking about is the pagans, like the Greek Syrian ruler Antiochus Epiphanes, that went into the temple of God and defiled it with an unclean animal on God's holy altar, right? right? So that the Maccabees, three years later, would have to then overthrow these, these Greek Syrian rulers and throw out paganism and take the defiled temple and rededicate it in a celebration you and I know as Hanukkah. Right. So he's actually talking about the destroying of Jerusalem. Right. That Jerusalem will no longer have Gentile pagans come in and desecrate it any longer. Right. He's not talking about a Cornelius who comes in with a clean heart and clean hands and says, I want to worship the God of Israel and I want to know your Messiah and I want to be cleansed from the sins of my pagan lifestyle. That person is accepted because Isaiah 56 says, in just four chapters later, all the Gentiles, their offerings will be allowed to be brought into the temple, into Jerusalem, into my, to me, on my holy altar. So how many know God has no problem with Gentiles? Yes. What he has a problem with is unclean, pagan, uncircumcised Gentiles like a Goliath who try to defy the armies of Israel. Yes. Amen. That, God says, they will no longer destroy your holy city. So let's separate the Gentile who's cleansed from the Gentile who's unclean. Now, you learning something today? Yep. Yes. Now watch this. I only have a couple thoughts more. He says, uh, verse 4, For thus says Adonai Elohim, Long ago my people went down where? To Egypt. To Egypt. Why does it always go back to Egypt? Right? Because every principle of deliverance goes back to being delivered from what? Egypt. Egypt. To live... There is what? Aliens. Aliens, foreigners, like you were Gentiles. You were living in Egypt like foreigners. And Asher, which is Assyria, oppressed them for no reason. Verse 7. But how beautiful on the mountains are the feet of him 
who brings good news, proclaiming shalom, bringing good news of good things, announcing salvation. It says to Zion, Sion, your, your God is what? King. King. Melech. Do you understand that Yeshua the Messiah claimed this verse as the one whose feet are so clean, so beautiful, that his feet are not defiled, that his hands and his heart and his words brought salvation? and restoration to Zion. Here's Israel in Egypt. Here's Israel bound by Assyria. Here's Israel bound by Babylon. And God says, just like I delivered you from all them and got rid of the unclean thing, I will do it again by he who brings the gospel of the good news. And that's Yeshua, the Messiah. Amen. He cleansed us from our sins. He washed away our sorrows. He washed away our pain and he has cleansed us from our defilement. So why go back? Come on, why go back to Egypt? Right. Why go back to Assyria? Why go back, and I'm talking about vacation time. Not, uh, why go back to Babylon? Why go back to the Persian way of life? Right. Esther didn't want to go back to that. Right. She was so glad she could finally tell someone she's a Jew. Man, she was silent for a long time. She was like, for such a time as this, I'm not going to be silent any longer. I'm Jewish. That's right. <laughs> so, so comes, someone comes up to me and says, oh, are you Jewish? They see a yarmulke or they see a, a, a Star of David. I say, yes, I am. <laughs> I say it with pride. They say, oh, you're Jewish. Now they want to treat me like the token Jew. I say, oh, let me share some things with you. Next thing you know, they're like, hey, can I come to your synagogue? <laughs> So, this is the thing that we see about being unclean. It's because of unclean practices. I love what verse 9 says. It says, break out into joy. Sing together the ruins of Jerusalem. See what happened? The unclean person, the Gentile, came in, sacked Jerusalem. He says, you're no longer going to have those unclean people with their unclean practices come in and destroy Jerusalem anymore. Why? Because he says in verse 9 here, he says, your, you, your ruins, it says, you're going to sing aloud, you ruins of Jerusalem. For Adonai has comforted his people. He has redeemed Yerushalayim. Adonai has bared his holy arm. Who's the holy arm of the Lord? Yeshua. Yeshua. In the sight of every nation and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of, uh, of your God. Right. Who is the Yeshua of God? Yeshua. Yeshua. Yeah. This is a messianic prophecy. Yeah. Yeshua preaching the gospel. Yeshua coming back and claiming your God is king. Yeshua restoring Jerusalem. And Yeshua fixes the unclean problem. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. I love this. Don't think we just stop with Jerusalem. Watch this. He goes on, though, to give an instruction. He says, verse 11, leave, leave, get out of there. Don't touch anything unclean. Get out from Get out from inside of it and be clean, you who carry out a nice temple equipment. You know what happened with the priesthood? They started dabbling with unclean things. Do you remember Ezekiel 814? They allowed the Israelites to worship the Babylonian God and the God of Mesopotamia, Tammuz. So much so that even the month is still named after a Babylonian name, Tammuz which refers to a shepherd god, which probably refers to a lot of agriculture. But nonetheless, this agricultural name was given over to a deity by the name of Tammuz. And sometimes, you might think of the sign of the cross. It actually was a pagan practice of making a, a tea for Tammuz that carried over into Catholicism. Yes, this is what uh, historians say when they break down the custom. The prayer beads of India are the same of the rosary. Now, I know a precious Catholic person that doesn't know any better. They don't know, so just don't blast people and treat them badly and say, you know, you're pagan, they're this and that. They know Yeshua ministered the truth to them, but do it in love. Right. Don't be harsh to people. Because right. people only know what they know, and they only do what they do, and until they know better, they don't do better. That's right. <laughs> that's, that's my sermon today. Yeah, yeah. Last point, watch this. It says it all. Ezekiel 20, verse 34. I will bring you out. Oh, I love this. I love this. I will bring you out from the peoples and gather you from the countries where you were scattered, where you were under pagan practices, where you were made to do pagan things. He says, with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Where we heard that at? Mm. Sounds like Passover, right? Exodus right. 6, 6, and 7. <laughs> with an outstretched arm, it says, and with fury poured out on those nations. Verse 41. I will accept you as a sweet aroma. I will bring you out from the people. I will gather you out of the countries where you have been scattered. And I will be hallowed, made holy, sanctified in you, in you, before the Gentiles. Wow. Gentiles will see your holy status, and they'll want it. That's what it's saying. 
Verse 42. Then you shall know that I am the Lord when I bring you into the land of what? Israel. Israel. Oh, yeah. Do we have Jews in the land of Israel? Yes. 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 Doing it now. Into the country for which I raised my hand in an oath to give to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Amen. Now you say, oh, Rabbi, that's Old Testament prophecy. Oh, no, it's not. Look at Revelation 18.1. Revelation 18.1 After these things I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having a great authority, and the earth was illuminated with his glory. And he cried mightily with a loud voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, has become a dwelling place of demons, a prison for every foul spirit, and a cage for every unclean and hated bird. Do you think it goes back to Leviticus 11, about what an unclean bird is? Yeah. Hello. We don't eat vultures, right? We don't even eat eagles. Praise they are. We don't eat them. They're unclean animals as far as eating goes. Verse 3. For all the nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. The kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. Pagan practice. And merchants of the earth have become rich through the abundance of her luxury. And I have... I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people. Wait a minute. This is no longer prophecies of the Old Testament. Watch this. This is no longer just the Hebrew Scriptures. This is the book of Revelation, the final book of the Bible, That's right. saying, Come out of her, my people. Sounds like Ted Pierce. Ted Pierce. Lest you share in her sins and lest you receive her plagues and her sins have reached to heaven and God has remembered her iniquity. Old oh, mystery Babylon and her pagan practices of all the goddess worship and Baal worship. Guess what? We're done with it. Sick of those pagan ways. They defile. And I'm not just talking about little idols or little Buddhas. I'm talking about pagan practices that we keep, that we don't keep the Torah. We fall into the trap of the world. Well, but everyone's doing it. So what if everyone's doing it? And we know a lot of people are going to places we don't want to go. That's right. We want to go up. We don't want to go down, right? So my only point today as I close, we must avoid that which is unclean or defiles our body as a temple. We must avoid that which is unclean or defies our body as a temple that refers to physical, for the most part. But we also need to allow Hashem to cleanse that which is unclean by Messiah, even on the inside. How many want to be clean on the inside today? How many feel that the Lord has cleansed some things on the inside? Get rid of all that junk. If you're receiving this message today, would you stand to your feet? I know it's been a long day, but God's done great and mighty things. I want to bless you in the name of the Lord. We've got to take those unclean things of our life that defile our temple and allow Hashem to cleanse the unclean by Messiah. Amen? Amen. So today I want to bless you. The Lord will shine His face upon you. Stretch your hands for the blessing today. You just say, Baruch Hashem. Baruch Hashem. Amen. <laughs> Ya era na nai pana belecha bi hunecha Isa tana hai pana belecha ya semlecha Shalom Amen May the Lord Adonai bless and keep you May the Lord Adonai shine his face toward you and be gracious to you with divine favor May the Lord Adonai lift up his countenance upon you and give you perfect peace Sar Shalom the Prince of Peace Yeshua HaMashiach, Yeshua Yeshua, Amen. God bless you today. Thank you, Lord. Have a good week. Good week. Wow, what Watch what you eat this week. <laughs> <laughs>
hands upon you. May the Lord grant you his peace. Ye verecha Adonai, the Yishmerecha, Yair Adonai, the Navelecha, the Hunecha, Yisa Adonai, the Navelecha, the Yase, the Chai.